Yeah, no problem. Here I am. Can you hear me? Excellent. Yes. Hey, yeah, this is Joey. What an honor it is to finally talk to you, uh, and not through email, uh, because I got to say that uh, at one time you were one of my favorite writers, um, but you haven't published anything in several years. That's in America anyway. Uh, why only Germany? There's Gregor. We got one. We're waiting on one more guy to come in. And um, why only Germany? The last few years. Uh, that's a great question. First of all, thank you so much for having me on here and for uh, showing interest in my career these days. It's pretty rare that an American reader contacts me because, yes, you are correct. Uh, the bulk of my audience is in the German domain. And, um, well, I, I'm not certain uh, why this is, but for starters, um, you had told me in the email that you had read Commonwealth. I think you said that that was the one you really liked. You see the first three novels, they were published um, by an American publisher in San Francisco. And back during the recession, they went bankrupt. And um, when this publisher went bankrupt, my German publisher stepped in and said, you know what, uh, we would like to buy all of your rights, meaning your world rights, that would even include the American and English rights. So in effect, uh, I've become, you could say, I am now a German author. I'm in a very unusual publishing situation, whereas the new uh, books that I write only appear in German, though I can barely speak the language myself. You don't live in Germany or anything then? Okay. No. I sure. I'm, I'm in Kentucky right now. I'm curious. Where... You're Eastern time, right? So you Zach and I are in Tennessee. We are Eastern time. Yeah. Gregor, uh, Ohio, right, Greg? That is correct. Okay. Somewhere in Ohio. Um, and we got another guy that we're expecting in Iowa. So, um, but I don't think any of these guys have read your books. Uh, but, you know, I've, I've been wanting to get you on, on one of my shows for quite some time. So. Well, thanks for having me. Are y'all doing all right during all of this? Yeah. I mean, I, I haven't really, my routine hasn't changed much because I've always, I've, I've been a shut in most of my adult life. So. <laughs> You're, you've got the social distancing thing down. You're right. Exactly. Um, uh, is it, is it Gobel or Gobel or Gerbil? Uh, Gobel. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, what about you guys, Zach and Gregor, uh, in, in response to his question? I've been doing pretty good. I still got – it seems like the professor is giving me more homework now that the apocalypse is happening that <laughs> I'll manage. Yeah, I work from home anyhow, and I have uh, been working from home for like seven years, so it hasn't really impacted me a tremendous amount as far as my daily routine. Mm. I've had more writing time. I know that. Me too. Me too. Uh, I'm I'm really careful when I talk about this coronavirus because um, the truth is the quarantine part. I'm really enjoying it. In fact, uh, this has been one of the best times of my life. But I know that sounds really insensitive. I don't want to. Uh, make light of it and I'm so sorry there are people suffering but uh, for a guy that's a homebody and an introvert uh, a lot of this really suits me and again I feel bad saying that but I could get used to this fellas <laughs> yeah it, 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 it kind of uh, equalizes everybody to show them you know how that how you lived it wasn't so bad before right they can finally yeah. understand you know maybe exactly like finally i'm not the weirdo <laughs> you know we're we're all on the same page it, finally it took a global pandemic for them to understand me 
<laughs> yeah, it, it used to be, uh, Ben, you drinking at home is, is weird and antisocial. Now it makes me an upstanding citizen. There you hey, go. Ben, I have a question, Ben. Go ahead. Why are you weaving up the show? <laughs> <laughs> it's Corona Chan. All hail Corona Chan. Is that Morgan from Dark Stalkers? No, it's Corona Chan. Uh, I don't. I don't. I'm not familiar. It's a uh, uh, just Corona. The coronavirus as an anime girl, basically. Uh, is it Medicare? Is it Medicare's? No, uh, it's a bunch of artists have done it. I just picked this random one off Google. Okay. Um, so Joey, uh, your first novel, uh, the anomalies, I'm actually mm -hmm. reading that one right now. I'd never gotten around to it. Um, but, uh, it's apparently, uh, I haven't gotten too far into it, but it's uh, basically about putting, uh, several really, um, unrelated people together in a rock band as kind of like experiment, right? Like an old lady and, uh, what, who else? Oh, there's, yeah, so there's an 80 year old white woman on guitar. There's the vocalist is a 20 something black male. There's uh, a little, like an eight year old girl uh, on bass and, and an Iraqi and a teenage Satanist. But yes, despite their um, differences, they've come together to form this unique band and but this is in a, a really small kentucky town and uh, just the idea of these five wildly different people being together uh that kind of bothers everybody else in the town they just they don't understand it and um so yeah that that was my first novel and it's funny, I say the other day, um, it probably wouldn't even be published nowadays because it's really politically incorrect. It, a lot awesome. of people might find it um, a little offensive. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that got you noticed to some degree, though, right? Good point. Yeah, I think because it was just so unusual, that's, that's what uh, got me published in the first place. So what, some, what was the reception like? Uh, in America, it did not sell well at all, but the critics liked it. I got some really good reviews from from some big papers like the Boston Globe, and um, but yeah, it, it. I mean, it wasn't exactly flying off the shelves. Uh, but then it, it did find an audience in, in Germany. It did a lot better over there. And, that, and, and you did say that you, uh, have enjoyed more, more, uh, success in Europe than America. Um, what about torture the artist? Um, well, what was the reception to that? Like more or less? Than okay. That's been my big hit. Um, and yeah, it did do better in America. Still, you know, nothing um, that impressive. But then, see, what happened was, even though it was my second novel, it was published first in uh, the German domain. So that was presented to the German public as my first novel. And um, it's by far... Uh, the the one that's sold the best and it's pretty much the one that I'm known for over there they retitled it Vincent because they said in German that torture the artist it just sounds horrible um, which is strange because it's such a melodic language German really I took four <laughs> semesters of German and I still don't understand any of it oh isn't it <laughs> difficult yeah I studied it for two years, and I can almost say one sentence now. You think it's melodic? It just strikes me as like clunky. Wait, how's this? It's a Jeremy ist ein Schinken. <laughs> uh, What's that? Jeremy is a um, gift. No ham. Oh, okay. <laughs> cool. I know how to say, uh, I think, no, you idiot in German. Nein, you Doomkampf. <laughs> but Jeremy is a yeah. gift. Jeremy is a gift, though. 
<laughs> Shishkopf. What is that? that? Something head. Shithead. <laughs> Shit. Yeah, shithead. <laughs> Um, tell tell the guys here who are unfamiliar about Torture the Artist because I think that that was you know my uh, early exposure to your work and then mm -hmm. Commonwealth like topped that one. But uh, yeah, go ahead and talk about Torture the Artist. Sure. Uh, so Torture the Artist is well the the artist in question is this uh, young man named Vincent and Vincent he's kind of like just your stereotypical uh lonely suffering artist he he's a loser in the game of love he's just kind of sickly and pale and and poor and uh he's an alcoholic and has uh, problems with um addiction and, and you name it this guy uh is suffering from it um, well, lo and behold, it, it turns out that all of this torture, all of this suffering is occurring uh, because his manager and kind of his surrogate father figure, Harlan, is secretly pulling the strings, manipulating his life, making sure that he never falls in love, that that he's never properly nourished and so forth and so on. The manager is operating under the age old assumption that creativity art comes from suffering and therefore to keep the uh, production of art going, he must keep the torture going. And That's he's a, paid to do this, right? It's 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 all a a, a money making endeavor. Uh, sadly, poor Vincent has no idea, though he thinks, "Oh, uh, you know, this is what artists do. They have these horribly shitty lives." Sorry, the way you I was gonna say the way you describe it, it sounds like uh, Franz Kafka's has the Hunger Artist meets the Truman Show. That's uh, you should be um, in in publishing if you're not already because that that would go really well on the back cover, definitely yeah. And um, every time that it seems like things are lining up and and everything's gonna you know uh, go well for him, this guy has to like intentionally derail it, um, mm. and uh, you can really feel how he. You know, he hates his job, you know, but he's doing it uh, and he he hates himself for it. Yeah, so it's narrated by Harlan, the, the guy that that's doing the torturing, uh, which I, I, I don't know. I, I guess that was the way to go. I just thought it put the narrator in a, a really uh, unique, uh, conflicted position. And he feels justified in doing it because uh, from his point of view, uh, if not for this suffering, think, think of all the great art that never would have been created. Um, but even Harlan himself, uh, he's being manipulated by this corporation who uh, is only seeing dollar signs. And what is his art? It, he writes for a TV show called Grocery Store, which yeah. the way you the way it was described in the book, I would probably watch that. I don't know. Sounded kind of intriguing, you know. Um, what what else does he do? Is he a musician too? I can't remember. Yeah, so he he would do TV, film scripts, and and write songs. And yeah, it was published in '04, I believe. And so uh, what you just described, I think there is a, a similar show to that now, Superstore. Ah, uh, okay. You know, yeah. so. Good. I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah, I might have a lawsuit on my hands. What do you mean? <laughs> they took my idea. Oh. <laughs> you know, um, uh, something else that there was a reality show in uh, the early two thousands uh, where Schmo. that's the one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I didn't, I, I didn't watch like every episode compulsively, but I was keyed in enough, you know, based on, you know, what people were saying word of mouth and everything that 
it was kind of like that. You know, it reminded me of Torture the Artist um, because the guy was the only one who wasn't in on it. All these other people were like part of these tests for him. And, uh, and, and he like proved time and time again that, you know, that he was a decent, you know, uh, individual and all of them were horrible for conspiring against him on a TV show. He didn't, you know, he didn't realize he was the subject of, but it, that reminded me of torture the artist, even though like, uh, torture the artist was like years before that, you know? So that was another thing where, where that your, your idea showed up in popular culture, you know, with a different twist. I watched Joe Schmo. I'm, I think it may have come on after wrestling. Um, and it, it was pretty fascinating. And the poor fella, when they did the big reveal on the finale, you know, he, he was a really good sport about it. Mm -hmm. But I, I think I read somewhere that in the years that followed, he, he fell into a deep depression. Hmm. One one so funny. <laughs> well, uh, he had a lot of money to dry his tears on, though. Right? I hope so. So hope there so. was actually a show where the main subject of the reality show didn't know he was on a reality show. He he thought it was a different kind of reality show where they competed for stuff. It was like a a, a, a surreal. Uh, what's it called? Surreal life or. Um, uh, Kind of like Big Brother, they he, they yeah. threw him in there with these other young people. But what he didn't realize is that some of these really uh, compromising situations he found himself in, they had been completely manufactured just to make him squirm. It's actually <laughs> okay, so, pretty cool. It, the execution yeah. of the show wasn't great, but the, the concept was pretty kind of wicked. Yeah, yeah, I remember. The guy, was. So it was a totally different the the the, the uh, pretense they got him on the show for was entirely different than what the actual subject of the show was. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Not I've not heard of that. When was that? When was that made? Two early. Yeah, early yeah. to mid two thousands or something. something like okay. That. Yeah, I never heard of that. <laughs> I remember there was a a show with a somewhat similar premise. I, I can't remember what it was called, but it was. Like they told people it was an American Idol type show where they, um, you know, would have auditions, except they would intentionally pick the worst people and basically make them think, oh, they're going to win this big thing and become like uh, the next, like, not American Idol, but kind of like that, just become that they're going to get a record deal and all of this. And then, like, at the very end, they just crush their dreams and reveal, no, we picked you because you were the worst. Ha ha ha. Oh, Jeez. No. That's. That yeah, that's pretty cruel. <laughs> that is cruel. <laughs> wow, that's pretty amazing. I've not heard of that show either. Yeah, I can't remember what it was called. It's like Search for the Next Star or something like that. It, it was pretty amazingly cruel. And they it was yeah. kind of funny how they tried to soften the blow when they you know, revealed to them, no, we only picked you because you suck and we wanted to laugh at you. <laughs> That's almost oh. Sue worthy. Like, I know that's not. Yeah. It's just uh, like, that's evil. They, yeah, they probably had them sign papers that are just like buried inside. It's, it it just says like you know you know you, you agree not to sue us for this shit. Or they're in, in, indemnified by the network or something, um, mm -hmm. as in yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Tor torture the artist was pretty fascinating in that uh, it, it really did explore that whole you know uh, suffering for art, starving artists kind of thing, you know. Um, as you know, an actual theme. Um, and uh, how long after that did it, was it before you wrote Commonwealth? Um, Commonwealth took me three years to write. Um, I, I've never worked so hard on a book as I did Commonwealth. And um, ironically, it's the one that's sold the least. Uh, even, even totally unfair yeah I'm sorry man we, we we dropped the ball there as as readers to not embrace that i mean well it uh the american publication coincided right when the recession hit and then in germany um because that german language is so verbose and and clunky uh anytime you translate a book into german it it adds about 
twenty percent of the word count. So um, in English, the thing was like I don't know five hundred fifty pages. In German, it ended up being like an eight hundred page novel, and um, th it is just too big, too much. Tell uh, tell the guys about that one. What that one's about. Uh, so the hero is a, a fella named uh, Blue Jean. Uh, think uh, Tiger King. Think Joe Exotic. It's like this mullet-headed guy who's obsessed with all things white trash, and uh, but the markets and wrestling and yeah, yeah, <laughs> and. Um, but the twist is he he happens to be um, the son of one of the wealthiest men in all the country. And so he's the black sheep of the family. And the whole idea is it's kind of a, a dramatization of American class conflict all within this family. I'll be honest. It, there's a there's a pretty radical shift um uh, towards towards the the middle um, where the the, the focus kind of pans out to something else you know uh, you know what I'm talking about right uh, when blue jean learns the truth about his origins yeah that yeah. and also uh, who he you know uh, falls in with uh, and and what what they pursue. Yeah, the punk rock girl, Jackie yeah. Stepchild. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I it and and that whole thing was just kind of a, a metaphor for uh, the ways that punk rock opened my eyes. Um, you know, before I discovered punk music, I was, you know, wearing polo shirts. Nothing wrong with polo shirts, but I, my point is, I was. Uh, obsessed with material things and uh you know when you're an impressionable 13 year old um i think something as um rebellious as punk rock can really uh, open up a whole new world for you mm -hmm. um oh and jackie likes wrestling too though that's something that we all have in common yeah, she well, she uh, she was like a booker for a local wrestling thing uh, early on in the book, and that's mm -hmm. how that's how she he, she kind of got into his good graces. I'll I'll be honest, and and I don't want you to spoil it, but for anybody who might read, you know this, but I did not understand the last page or paragraph at all. It was like a dream, but I didn't quite get what it represented and if you explain it to me in anything here other than email you know it might spoil it for anyone who's wanting to read it but uh was there supposed to be some big message because i did it kind of ended quietly I, I didn't i didn't understand what you were getting across in that dream yeah um this is quite embarrassing some of the german press asked me about that and uh, i can't remember i think <laughs> i think there was a, a message in there but um yeah the last page it's it's all um well the whole book this big dream the mother the mother of blue jean has this prophetic dream and and all the family's hopes are built upon this prophetic dream and then finally the last page i describe what the dream is and uh i surely at the time it was full of symbolism it was but, a real head scratcher though to be <laughs> yeah, and, yeah i don't i don't remember that it almost that seemed awful? like absurd it seemed like an absurd thing to to look at in look into as being symbolic of anything and mm -hmm. i thought that was may have been the point it could to kind of shore up you know the idea that she was anything other than you know silly right or thinking that that was what you would pin your the family's hopes on <laughs> i 
there was that little boy Arthur. I I think that if I remember correctly, the dream suggested that Arthur would someday become like this messiah-like philosopher king. I don't remember um, Arthur. I don't. Yeah. Remember Arthur character who is who was yeah it? just little little boy the little boy. Hmm. But um, Blue Jean, do, he doesn't. Does he come into money? I don't remember. Yeah, he does. Um, and then he founds like a, a commune, right? What he does is, um, you know, all across America, there are these abandoned Walmart buildings because back in the 90s, every town upgraded from a regular Walmart to a Walmart super center. And nowadays they don't even call them super Walmarts anymore. It's just a given. Your your town's going to get a, a Walmart super center. But um, when the transition was made in the late 90s to the super center, that meant that all across the land there were these abandoned Walmart buildings. And for me, that always seemed like a, a symbol of American excess um to just see these sprawling vacant parking lots in in every town in every city and so um blue jean sees one of these vacant walmarts and and the idea is he changes throughout the the book and he shows the people what wealth can really do and so what he does, he, he buys the Walmart, a building that's near and dear to his heart, by the way. And uh, and he he turns it in. Yeah, that, that would be a pretty good word for like a commune. It, it becomes free housing, free recreation. He has uh, a, a doctor's office in there. It becomes this place that the town goes to if they need something and everything is absolutely free there. So it's kind of like this uh, utopian site. Yeah, he does do some good with it early on until the, it kind of gets out of control and everyone just taking advantage of him. I, is that is that good enough, boys? I didn't spoil anything, really, did I? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> Because this was an issue on the last program, and and, and uh, like uh, allegedly, I spoil things too much, so I don't know now. I don't know how to even talk about books like I. You're wouldn't. doing pretty good this time. Yeah, you are doing pretty good this time, but I thought you said you didn't care. About <laughs> I don't. I, I really don't, but I don't want to relive the hell that was last night either. So. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I don't know. What do you, how do you feel about about it, Joey? About him spoiling? Yeah, I mean, yeah, about about people talking about books and generally spoiling them while they're talking about them on a um, show like I'm, this. I, I, you know, I just keep trying to nudge the conversation towards wrestling in case I you know. haven't noticed. And it, it's I know just... we're getting there. Yeah. <laughs> Because that's what I used to e uh, trade emails with you um, back in like 2008 or so. Um, and uh, you wanted to talk more about wrestling, you know, than uh, your own books, which I can understand because, you know, you wrote them and, you know, you exhausted all that energy and those mental reserves. And, and it's like you have your own entertainment. You know, it's like that's somebody's entertainment and you have your own to go to. So. <laughs> Uh, well, it's just central to my existence, wrestling. I, I mean, I understand. Uh, <laughs> I, I bet you like uh, Dark Side of the Ring, right? Tell me you've watched it. Oh, I, I don't guess I have. Seriously? Okay, hold on. We'll get, we'll get back to that. Do you know what it okay. is, though? Do you know what he's talking about? It sounds familiar. Is it a documentary series? On documentary series on Vice TV and YouTube. You can watch oh, okay. the episodes for free. Um, and uh, they talk, they cover the dark, obviously the darker stories and scandals in professional wrestling history, like, um, you know, the Chris Benoit thing, mm -hmm. uh, 
Jimmy Snuka and, and uh, how he got away with the murder of his girlfriend in 1983. That's coming up, uh, I think, tomorrow. Uh, the Brawl for All, which I didn't think would be a dark episode, but it actually pretty much was. Uh, New Jack and how he got away with stabbing somebody in the ring. So you get the idea. It's like real stuff where wrestling got a little too real. Um, I have written this down, Dark Side of the Ring, and it's it's strange to me even that I have never watched this. So, Yeah, man. What, what's the deal? If you liked Beyond the Mat or mm-hmm. Hitman Wrestling with Shadows, you, you, you'll like this. Uh, I have, I've seen those, so yeah, I'll check it out. It's that same feel but like they always managed to pull out this juicy revelation that no one you know had discussed before uh so they're really good about their research but um yeah they're there you even like uh kind of pay tribute to wrestling in commonwealth and torture the uh, not torture the artist but commonwealth so you said it's central to your existence i'm sure growing <laughs> up in kentucky isn't that uh where there was a training center that Jim Cornette ran? Yeah, well, um, in Louisville, they had... Ohio um, now, no, not... R- yeah, it was it was basically like their minor league, like what NXT used to be. Where they and, got guys ready to... Yes. To and yeah. they, they were even using it up until recent years, for instance, like... You know, Randy Orton and John Cena, before they were ready for uh, TV, you know, they'd, they'd have to uh, do a tenure at, in Louisville. Uh, but, see, I am on the Ohio River in Henderson, and it's across uh, the river from Evansville, Indiana. And uh, they have the Coliseum in Evansville, and uh, Mid South Wrestling would would go Jerry Lawler. He's like a god in Evansville, Indiana. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, uh, Kentucky is is fertile ground for wrestling. It's just something that I've been interested in since the late '80s, and um, not too satisfied with. Uh, their product right now with the WWE, but Man. I I still tuned in for WrestleMania. Did That's you kind all? of like a holiday for wrestling fans, isn't it? Even yeah. though it was very, it wasn't the same. It's not the same without a crowd, you know, because they feed off the energy <clears throat> of the fans and they kind of you know get inspired on what direction they take to mm-hmm. get to the 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 end of the match, you know, but. Um, yeah, uh, I, I remember just being amazed with Commonwealth. You know, I told everybody around me who who read at all, you know, just how amazing it was. And then there's this large gap of time from then until, you know, all the way to today where uh, there's no American releases from you. And it, and it was really uh, disappointing that there was never a follow up. And I was I even thought that eventually you guys would you would get squared away and, and get a, an, uh, a release in, in America for I against Osborne. Cause I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm itching to see what that's about. Um, but it, it's never come. So like that there, they really must have a, like a major hold on those rights to, to well, not, uh, so yeah, there've been two, uh, books released in German since Commonwealth. And so one is I against Osborne, and then the last one is called I Know It's Going to Happen for You Someday. Um, there is still a possibility that uh, the rights will be sold to an American publisher. Um, I have a, a wonderful German publisher. Um, they're the largest uh, independent literary publisher in Europe. And um, they have attempted to interest American publishers in in these last two books. But uh, what we're finding is that New York just really isn't that interested in Joey Goebel. Um, 
but I, I, I do really appreciate you uh, continuing to show interest in my career. And I would imagine eventually these books will see the light of day in America. What is, what is this? Summer Man and other black co co comedies? Oh, uh, I, that is something that I printed up myself uh, to help my wife at the time. She was starting like an online store to sell her wares and i said hey let me print up some copies of this book to get my readers to buy your shit and um so that's kind of something i did for her uh it's not it's not bad my mom said that's one of the best things i ever wrote so summer man huh it's a collection yeah, now, it's now, a, is your a, mom a very tough critic? I mean, is your mom a pretty <laughs> tough critic? I mean, what's going on? It no, seems like a no, quite she's, a strange endorsement. <laughs> she's not a tough critic, like not at all. Like, in fact, if if I like pick my nose and said, "Mom, check this out," she goes, "Well, Joey, that is just the best booger you." I swear, <laughs> honey, no, nobody does it better than you. Your boogers so she's are the best. Supportive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay. She's my number one fan. No, uh, Summer Man, that was, I think I'd classify as a novella. It's it's not a short story. It's not a novel. It's a novella. And then I threw in some other short stories just to uh, make it longer. Now, what so is why do you I think it is that the, the Germans li like your stuff and that the, it doesn't seem to hit hit in the United States? What's the, what, what's the, what's the quality the of it? Germans they, are awesome. They are awesome. Uh, I... I don't know. I've been told that we share a, a similar sense of humor, and humor is an important part of my writing. Mm -hmm. um, I always look at it from a business point of view. The the publisher over there, as I say, they're just they're really good. Uh, they have a lot of great authors. I don't know what they want with me, but I'll, I'll go along with it. So they right. know what they're doing. They're they're really good at marketing and promoting, and it's a cultural thing. Uh, the the novel, the literary novel, I'll add to that, is alive and well over in Germany, right. uh, in a way that I don't think it is anymore in America. Yeah. Uh, when I go on tours over there, I'm always amazed at just the sheer amount of bookstores over there and how uh, book signings are like, are still a big deal over there. I'm, I'm amazed at the crowds huh. that we get. So I, I think it's a, a, a cultural difference uh, with g just general interest in reading even. Right. Right. How do you, so, uh, with, do you have a, do you have a representative and interpreter? Uh, I mean, when I do the tours and when you communicate with your publisher at all. Yeah. Uh, in general, that's, that hasn't been a problem. They, well, being from Kentucky, I can tell you they, they speak far better English over there than we do here. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of folks in Europe speak, uh, yeah, speak English well. So do you think it, the, the appeal is, you know, I haven't read the books, right. But what I can tell of what we're, <laughs> But looking at the synopses uh, on Goodreads and what you guys have discussed thus far, it seems as if, you know, you take a very, um, I don't know, you're, you're kind of lampooning American culture. Do you think that they get a thrill out of that? Uh, that's probably part of it, yeah. Um, especially, like, my earlier work was more satirical. The last right. couple novels, uh, the ones that Jeremy... I have has not read those are more realistic uh but the the first three you know i was really big on kurt vonnegut when i was younger and mm. so they're kind of imitating him poorly but uh that that's probably part of it they i mean for all of um you know the hating that goes on uh towards america people you know they're still fascinated. They can't turn away from us. It right. doesn't matter who the president is. And it doesn't matter how dumb they think we are. They they want to see what we're doing. They can't, right. can't turn away. So that's probably part of it. 
So do you have a, um, a good relationship with the translator? Have you been using the same translator for several books, or is it a different translator on each book? No, it's the same one each time, um, and I've met him a couple of times. His name's Hans Herzog, and um, in general, though, he, he doesn't have that many questions for me, um, which is funny because, like, slang is an important part of, of the way my characters speak and mm -hmm. but uh i don't know i guess he just googles it or gets on urban dictionary right <laughs> so have you ever i mean he speaks uh, you, you ever had a conversation with him he speaks fluent english he seems to be uh hip on the uh you know colloquialisms or you know what i mean yeah, uh, we've had dinner a couple times, and uh -huh. um, there was no confusion. So, Does he have uh, a good sense of humor? I think so, yeah. Um, so here, here's the thing. My German is not good enough that I can read these things. You know, right. I'd, be, I'd be terribly confused. So I have to go off the opinion of, of the other people I talk to over there. Uh, I hear good things. I, I hear now I will say a lot of them say, yeah, it's, it's a good translation, but I'd still prefer to read it in, in the author's original language. Okay. So do you, do you, what's the split as far as German language sales in Germany versus English language sales in Germany? You know? Oh no, I, I don't know that. I, I know that English copies are getting harder and harder to come by. But okay. of course, they're they're still the ebooks. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, so you can't buy an English copy version of your last two books in Germany, can you? Or can you? Correct. Correct. No, there's the only, the, only, the only copies that exist are like Microsoft Word copies. So no, I okay. can't. Yeah. Okay. All right. What is I against Osborne about? It um. So. The concept is it's one day in a Kentucky high school in the late 90s. And uh, so each chapter is a different class and it, it takes place in real time. And then in between the, the chapters, you know, the, the guy goes to his locker and the centerpiece of the novel is lunch in the cafeteria. And, uh, that's that's basically it. Osborne in the title. That's the name of the school, uh, Osborne High, and it's all narrated from this, you know, uh, this misfit named James Weinbach. And the hard part was figuring out, well, how how do I get a story arc in here that takes care of itself within one school day? Um, I mean, how did you? I don't know if I even did it. <laughs> I mean, that's a that's hard to pull off. You know, he he starts with a problem, goes about fixing mm -hmm. it, struggles, and then either fails in the attempt or or succeeds. And that's hard. That is that would be hard to achieve in one day of time. We did it in that film. What three o'clock high? Remember that. Right, yeah. yeah, I actually watched that film when it when I was writing this book. I was hoping it would give me some ideas. Yeah, that, that was a place over pretty good movie. What's that? That took place over one day. I forgot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um. So the guy, the but the guy, uh, the kid dresses like really dresses and grooms himself like almost posh, right? And, and he looks down on all his classmates for not being as, um, I don't know, posh as him, right? Is that right? Yeah, he wears a suit to school. And the idea, he's just this really old fashioned kid. Um, he he kind of behaves like an old man, even though he's 17. And so that's the source of his conflict with the rest of the school. Um, he views his peers as these uh, silly little children. And, and, and um, he also views 
the world as a place that has lost its class. He 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 sees himself as this this classy. He he thinks of himself as the last gentleman, right? And, he's a man and, out of time, yeah, r- exactly. Yeah. It's, and it, he's the, is he the supreme gentleman? <laughs> What's that? that? He said, is he the supreme gentleman? And it sounded <laughs> as if he was giggling as if that meant something to somebody other than than uh, Ben. So uh, what, what Elliot, you... uh, Elliot Rogers. I don't oh, know. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess he's saying, is he an incel? <laughs> does he say my lady yeah. a lot? Yeah. Does he <laughs> wear a fedora that he tips at people? Uh, he doesn't take it that far, but he should. <laughs> It's it's interesting that that character description sounds very similar to a character in a book. That I'm sure it's entirely different, right? I mean, this the book that I'm thinking of is a horror novel called uh, Black Heart Boys Choir, and the oh, yeah. and the antagonist of that book sounds exactly like what you're describing. Uh, the you know as the character, the lead character in this book. But, I think I against Osborne came first. I know you're not insinuating anything. No, 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 I'm not. No, I mean, what? Yeah, what the book I'm talking about is a horror novel. This isn't a horror novel, correct? Right, correct. And there's yeah. no there's no black unicorn demons running around in this book either. I would I would think. No, it probably would have helped me sell some copies, but no. this one didn't do as well in Germany. You say. <laughs> I did all right, but I right. think in in general genre fiction sells better. I've I've flirted with the idea of writing like sci-fi or something, but right. I don't know. I I normal I normally stick with uh, literary fiction. Yeah, I, I, that comes across <coughs> that you're you uh, you you kind of have this dramatic flourish that that reminds me of um, you know like actual literature i mean i consider all books literature but i know what people mean when they say literature basically you know it it's it's a different kind of tone and sensibility right it's generally character driven right you know yeah oftentimes. Yeah. yeah but uh, so so is the translator an author in his own right I don't think he is. Okay. I think uh, he's he's a full time translator. Okay. Sorry, uh, Jeremy. I think you might have had something. I, I just that was a question I meant to ask a few minutes ago. I, I, I just had to get it out because no, OCD. I guess that's fine. Anybody wants to jump in? Uh, but uh, the uh, I, I'm. I, is there any chance of us seeing this? In American, so you think you could talk to him about it, or? Um, well, <clears throat> excuse me. I think at this point, what's more likely to happen is that the fifth book would would see publication before the fourth. And, and uh, what is that about? Something good is going to happen to you someday? Yeah, uh, I know it's going to happen for you someday. It's a mouthful. Um, it is a collection of short stories but they're kind of interconnected you see the same characters uh pop up like in in the background throughout the the book so it's kind of a a novel in stories Mm. and it's um I don't know. The inspiration was this old book uh Winesburg Ohio and it's it's just about these uh, lonely people in a small town. It's like I mean, think of uh, the Beatles, and Eleanor Dandelion, Rigby. Uh, would Dandelion Wine be a good comparison? I not sure. Dandelion Wine. Ray Bradbury. I it's haven't read it. Town, it's about a town too, and the and all and all its people. So. Mm-hmm. And he re- references um, Winesburg, Ohio, when he talked about when he used to talk about it. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, like every story is about a lonely person. The tragedy is if if they were only aware of each other, they could they could find each other, but that doesn't happen. Oh yeah. Um, you know why? Yeah, I wonder what a Joey Goble horror novel would look like, though. I mean, surely, surely you you had some ideas in the back of your head about that, right? 
I have um even under a pen name, you could write something under a pen. Yeah, don't write a horror novel. Write a science fiction or fantasy novel. You'll make some money off of that. Horror doesn't make any money. <laughs> horror doesn't make any money? Are you crazy? <laughs> it, it doesn't. doesn't. How? It doesn't. What are you talking does about? does not make money no. anymore. Not, nothing does not money. make money at all. Like that. I've actually heard it said from some of the horror publishers I've worked with that horror is like the only genre that didn't recover after some kind of big crash. That's How why weird you, is that? Not, though, you never see it in mass market. It's only niche stuff. And if How it is it? Because everybody has read a horror novel at some point, though. Everybody has, right? Sure. Well, it's just yeah, not everybody's read a Stephen having, King novel. That doesn't yeah. count. If you just if you eliminate Stephen King, you, nobody makes any money on it. <laughs> yeah, if, I guess if you want to make money, like write romance. Well, yeah, that are thrillers, <laughs> right? Yeah, mystery, thriller, romance. Those are the top you know, genres. And then well below that is science fiction fantasy. And then way, way, way below that. Almost not even, almost too small to even mention is horror. Yeah. You know, and then, below, sales go. And then below that is all of us, uh, Joey excluded. Oh well, yeah. Yeah. The, below the, yeah. Then there's, then there's bizarro, which is just like a footnote in some kind. Uh, of, you know. Oh, by the way, I did see in your bibliography that you did uh, publish uh, a few, a story or two in uh, an old uh, magazine called "Bust Down the Door and Eat All the Chickens." Yeah, I came across that the other night because this is the first time I've had time to clean the house like in 13 years because of this virus, you know. Yeah. And I, I, I found that. Why do you ask about that? Well, because uh, Gregor or Ben just now mentioned Bizarro Fiction. Mm. Uh, with, I'm not sure whether you're familiar with it or not, but I think that it was edited by Bradley Sands, who wrote for Eraser Ed Press for several years, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. It, it was uh, it was edited by Sands. That sounds right. Yeah. Um, what was what st what story was in there? What was it about? Oh man, I moved it to the other room. I wish I had kept it in here now. <laughs> That's um, awesome. what was it? The, it may have been surrealist party. Um, that one was about a party with a theme of surrealism. So everybody just came like with hypodermic needles taped to their foreheads. <laughs> um, or it may have been robo tripping about a robot with a drug problem. I used to write some kind of silly stuff. So it wasn't about Robotus and uh, abuser, <laughs> abusers. <laughs> no, no. Okay, robot that's what they. That's what they yeah, that's what they call. Uh, you know, if you abuse Robotus and it's called rope going robo. If you. Yeah, yeah, Ro yeah. robo tripping. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was that, that. That was part of the reason for the title was the Robotus and. Uh, yeah, I'd heard about robo tripping on the right. news. I'd right. be scared to do it myself. No, I've never <laughs> done robo tripping myself. I mean, Jeremy has, I know, but I don't know. That. Was that was that actually a, a real thing, or was it like one of those things that the news made up that no one actually did? Like, what, like no, I, I, I knew people that did it. Yeah, <laughs> Jingham, or, yeah, Jingham, uh, that's what they fucking called it. Or blue myth. <laughs> No strawberry myth, yeah. Or like rainbow rainbow parties or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, that, that's rainbow parties. It was a fight. stupid. I, I've mixed some things, there's no question, but uh, I, I don't know. What was it? Robitussin and what? Just Robitussin. You just drank like a whole bottle of Robitussin and you. Oh, like, no, no, tripping. I'm not that stupid. Uh, <laughs> well, but let's see. If I was going to, it'd be NyQuil, not Robitussin. You can't say you're robo tripping then if you drink Nyquil. Though. Right. No like like Lewis Black used to say, uh, Robitussin, why even bother? Sissy pansy, non narcotic bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I guess it's I mean, lean is a thing, which is where they mix a uh, Seven Up and uh, prescription cough syrup. Uh, I've yeah. never heard of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's got the Nyquil's got the colors of the uh, of Christmas. Feel like you're celebrating right in Christmas, red and green. Yeah. <laughs> but um Dayquil's orange. Exactly. Um oh. but uh 
Yeah, I think the best character that you ever wrote, though, that I've read so far would be Blue Jean. Um, and uh, are we going to see the Wormland group in any more of your fiction if you ever publish this side on this side of the you know the globe again? Uh, doubtful, but I am glad that you, you remembered that group. Uh, I, re I do recall the critics. That was one thing that they actually liked about that book is the fact that, you know, the Wormland's only mentioned like two or three times. So, uh, I think the problem with that book is I just, I wrote way too much and that was one of the few instances where i pulled back and decided less was more uh but in general with my books there's not uh overlap they're they're all independent of one another hmm. um so you're not you're not big on like building up a universe so that's really popular with authors right now and i think stephen king and a few others started that craze and now everybody does it they cross reference characters and events and places between their books you know and it's it, it's kind of a fun thing like you know um what do they call them easter eggs for readers yeah. to pick up on um stephen king popularized that i think but now most authors are doing it are you not a big fan of that when you say that. well no i i am i mean i mentioned vonnegut earlier and and i think most of his novels take place in the same universe and i've been tempted to set them all in the same town but for whatever reason i i just did i was kind of self-conscious about it i thought would this seem self-important if if it's always in the same fictional town and and i have cameos from the other characters i don't know um i will say I, they always take place in kentucky um i think commonwealth actually i never come out and say what state it is but actually the state of kentucky it's not even a state it's a commonwealth oh y'all from tennessee have you seen that um the chart that compares your Corona experience to Kentucky's. No, was it good or bad? Zach it's stepped a, away for a minute, so um, I'm it's, the only one that can answer. Well, sorry, that's bad for y'all. Well, I think Sullivan County got really lucky because uh, <clears throat> up until like a week and a half ago, we were still only like in the single digits with our uh, casualties uh, or infected. You know, but uh, I don't know what it is now um so kentucky is faring better you're saying yeah so there's the now famous comparison between uh, philadelphia and st louis from 1918 and you know uh i think st louis was the one that did the social distancing and philly was the one that did not mm -hmm. and so st louis has the the famous flattened curve Whereas with Philly, it's just this tremendous spike. Well, uh, somebody had the idea, well, let's compare Kentucky and Tennessee because we share a border. And there were two quite different approaches taken by our governors. So we got this guy, Andy Bashir. The whole state is experiencing Andy mania right now. And, and this dude he was just really hardcore from the get go about taking everything extremely seriously. He was one of the first governors in all the land to say, you know what, let's, let's not do church. Let's not meet up for church. And that was a big political risk in a state as religious as Kentucky. See, I don't um, agree with, I don't agree with taking that step personally. Um, I, now more than ever, people who are religious, need that you know to go to you know if they fit even more so now if they you probably i imagine you, you you're probably not religious i don't know but you know i feel like uh now would be a time for them to need church more than ever i don't go to church and i'm religious but uh you know, i don't agree that they should be like ha get, getting threatened from uh, antifa for for holding a service or threatened with arrest by the police I mean, Wait, I just got back. How did this church conversation start? 
Uh, because he mentioned <laughs> that uh, Kentucky's numbers of coronavirus infections are better than Tennessee's, but because you know we're we're both pretty close. And um, he said that uh, his governor was taking it like really serious from the beginning and, and announced that, uh, you know, they wouldn't hold services. Is that the gist of it, Joey? That's the gist of it. Yeah. Just, um, yeah, some, somebody looked at the numbers and, and uh, I do identify as a Catholic. Hmm. Um I, I wouldn't say religion is is at the center of my life because that's where wrestling is, right, fella? <laughs> right. <laughs> religion, too, right? <laughs> yeah, but no, I mean it, it is important to me, and I I, I see what you're saying. Um, but this Andy Bashir fella, he comes on. They call it afternoons with Andy. <laughs> Every every day at four o'clock, he comes on, and talks to us like Mister Rogers or something. But um, you're gonna hear, you're gonna be hearing about this guy. He's he's kind of riding a wave right now. Uh, anyway, uh, for you know, say what you will. He's he we he's gotten good results, is what I'm trying to say. He's it's, it's it's working out pretty well so far, but who knows. So yeah. Tennessee has 4,634 confirmed cases uh, and only 34 in Sullivan County. So we're doing pretty good here in my good. little slice of Tennessee. I still think that a lot of these, that, that these numbers are conflated and that yeah. they're go ahead, going ahead and, and categorizing flu and pneumonia as coronavirus. But, you know, who knows? Well, uh, I'm glad y'all are doing well. Where is Sullivan County? What part of the state? Southeast, Zach, right? Or, or Northeast? We're Northeast, right? Yeah, you're Northeast. I'm more just Mideast, I guess. Okay. Wait a second. How did you not know that you were in Northeast Tennessee? Because I, I, I rarely go anywhere else. So. <laughs> but you're right there on the border of Virginia. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, I could pick out pick it out on a map, but I don't know. I guess I don't know the specifics of how they connect or whatever. I don't know it. I don't know. Maybe you're actually in Indiana, aren't you? Who? Uh, that's a bad joke. I don't get it. Because <laughs> you didn't seem to know where you are geographically. It'd oh, be okay. funny. <laughs> he's actually he's in Wyoming. It turns out. <laughs> <laughs> um. But uh, so, yeah, man, what, what do we do? What do we need to do? Do we need to start a letter writing campaign? Would they be able to read them if we did to, to get, you know, Joey novels in English again? Well, I'm going to I'm going to maybe tomorrow I'll send an email because mm -hmm. you know what? It, it is something that I I talked to the German publisher for the record. They're in Zurich, Switzerland. They're actually Swiss. Oh, but uh, right. but. I tax gimmick, I'll bet. <laughs> I I do every once in a while. I say, hey, what's what's going on? You know, do you, have you found me an American publisher? And and they, you know, they say we're we've approached some some New York publishers, um, but there's usually just not a lot of interest. Does so, it have to be New York? I, I I mean, what about like Seattle or? You know, perish the LA thought. Even, yeah. That's uh, good. Good point. It it doesn't. No, it doesn't have to to be New York. That's just that happens to be where most of their contacts are. Right. And and you know, so if it were to happen in America, it would probably be New York. But I mean, I'm not opposed to even a, a Kentucky publisher doing it, like a university press or something. Right. I I would. You know. I mean it. I would love for my family and friends to be able to read these last two books. Um, my, my Swiss publisher has, you know, asked me to be patient. And um, so I, I will continue to be patient. And, um, uh, but I, I do think it's probably time to see if there's any news in that arena. But with all that's going on, they may just laugh and, you know, it's like, dude, it's really not a good time also, you know, but, uh, I mean, uh, 
if you sh if you mentioned in passing, you know, that you came on here and we're like, dude, where's the books? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm kind of picturing a lot of these editors um, being at home and having a little extra time to to read some manuscripts. So, oh, yeah. you know, I mean, we I see a lot of silver linings with with all this stuff. You know. Cool. Um. So, have you? And also, have you? Uh, you said you printed up that one book for yourself to, to help your wife at the time. Have you considered small press publishing? Are you familiar with any of that? Um, I don't know a lot about it. Um, so, publishing. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I've I've flirted with the idea. I don't know if you were to talk to me, you know, five years from now, and the last two books still aren't out there. I'd I'd certainly consider it. Mm -hmm. But you you want to try to start at the top with the big, the what is it? The big three or big five in publishing, and they're all you. Most of them are in New York, right? Yeah, that's that's the basic premise going on right now the my, Mo my money Mo money right my publisher wants to, to to start with new york and see what happens mm -hmm. um well uh okay now i guess now we can talk about wrestling so uh <laughs> i don't know who 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 are some of your all-time favorites well, um, I love it when people ask me this. My my favorite wrestler of all time would be the Macho Man. Um, oh, yeah. My favorite living wrestler would be CM Punk. You know what? I, at one time, I would have I would have said uh, name dropped him too, but he's really become a jerk in the last few years. I know he goes by CM Punk, but I mean he's taken it to a real whole other level of mean spirited. You know. Oh, I didn't know this. I knew. Uh, I mean, I know things didn't go the way he wanted it to with the MMA. Um, has he been mistreating the fans or something? Well, yeah, he's disrespectful to fans, to fellow wrestlers. Uh, he he kind of snuck his way into a job as a commentator on uh, for ESPN, uh -huh. uh, and WWE just negotiated for um, SmackDown to air on ESPN. So they have to interact with CM Punk, even though he's not contractually, you know, going to wrestle for them. They still have to put up with him because he's. ESPN's choice of commentator for a, sma a SmackDown ESPN show. It, it really, cannot, like, really diabolical way to get back at them for the way that he parted ways with them several years ago, you know? Hmm. Well, that, that makes me view him in a different light. Um... Well, I mean, don't get me wrong. You know, a few years ago, he was the man, you mm -hmm. know, dropped the pipe bombs, you know, on the microphone, figuratively speaking. Um, I really like what Bray Wyatt's been doing creatively lately. Definitely, yeah. Um, WrestleMania was just—I don't know. It's it is kind of depressing, but that interest. Yeah, tell me, me. tell me about that. What, what? How did that go? Because that was a wrestling event with no audience, right? Was it correct? Was it peculiar? Was it like really kind of like quiet, or did they have like? paid shills that were just like the crew out there just making noise <laughs> they just had a couple of commentators and some the crew and no there there was no audience um it was bizarre uh oh, i i think i most Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think most people are, are viewing it as a success, but only because expectations were so low. You know, how, how could you possibly have a WrestleMania without the element of the audience? Mm -hmm. um, so th the fact that no one died on camera, that, that, that you know what I mean? The, the bar right. was set really low for, for the standard of a, a good show. Um, 
but it was strange yeah um so jeremy when you watched this did you weep no uh I, honestly i only watched a few matches i watched the girls matches and uh the main events like goldberg and braun Strowman, and i was happy to see goldberg lose it because i think he's a prima donna um now more than in his wc wcw days um and uh drew mcintyre beat beating brock lesnar which i i i, I you know i could have wept at that because Brock Lesnar is the man. I mean, he's like the consummate professional. And, I mean, he's really fought in MMA, you know, and really won and done well at it. So, I, I, I buy Brock Lesnar as a champion anytime he's holding the belt. I mean, I doesn't it – when you were watching it, was it like watching a film without the score? Yeah, it, it was very noticeable. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good that's a good uh, summary for it. Yeah, a movie without the score. If you take out all the dramatic flourishes and music from a movie, you know, it loses something major. Right. But you know what? If they would have piped in like, you know, audience chants and and you know, it, it would have been just as awkward because you know we're hearing audience reactions, but there's no audience there. You know. It would have been just as awkward, so they really had no choice. Yeah. I know that they. I think that they found a contractual loophole where they can still perform uh, now and do the shows live again without having to pre-tape them. Uh, yeah. And I think that they may even be able to, can, you know, call themselves essential workers because uh, you know the world needs entertainment right now. I think there's some contractual loophole with. Um, uh, where they're, they're stationed in Florida right now. So but. Huh. so this is a question for both Joey and Jeremy. Have you guys ever actually wrestled a man? <laughs> <laughs> Joey, you go first. Yes. A full-grown man, or was this in high school? <laughs> <laughs> um, is hi high school... Um, yeah, throughout my childhood, you know, we, we had twin beds and we'd push the mattresses together. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've only wrestled boys and teenagers or have you actually wrestled a, a full grown man? I haven't wrestled a full grown man. And just no. so we're clear, you were a boy or a teenager when you were wrestling these boys and teenagers, correct? <laughs> Right, right. Okay. All right. Yeah, same 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 thing here. What about you, Jeremy? Uh I wrestled a woman once, you know, did the the uh the one the one that actually put up with me for a little while, you know, uh that actually got somewhere with, yeah. Uh I I, I guess you could did say you win? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh no, because like I'm like the only person on earth that doesn't enjoy sex apparently, so <laughs> I don't understand, but so you never have wrestled a man. I mean, if you're talking about actual pro wrestling, no, no, no just wrestling Greco-Roman. No, no, wrestling. no, no. Actually, uh, in gym class once, though. Okay, yeah, I guess this counts. Me and my buddy were big into uh, uh, wrestling uh, growing up, and uh, we got the idea. Yeah, we even just like true pro wrestlers, we worked out what we were going to do ahead of time. While these other people were doing these takedowns and all that, and like, you know, actual, yeah, Greco Roman, like amateur style, right. uh, I was, I, we thought that we were doing the smarter thing. We were outsmarting all of them because I grabbed my buddy and body slammed him. Right. And, and, and counted like I was a ref too. See, because the, the, the gym, the gym coach, the gym teacher, he wouldn't count it. But he was because he was too busy laughing, and then he uh -huh. explained to me that's not this kind of wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I used to do good body slams with that guy. Yeah, he cooperated well. <laughs> so, so was this guy significantly smaller than you? He was a bean pole. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, since you've been a full grown man, you've never wrestled a man. No. Okay. I, I haven't either. So I'm just I'm just curious. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, the 
people I know that love music the most are ones that can't play an instrument because for them, there's still a lot of mystery uh to to music so right right i don't i don't want to wrestle a man <laughs> because that it, it would ruin it would ruin watching it on tv <laughs> so that that's the only thing that's keeping me from getting up on some guys and and doing it right I'll, uh, wrestling I'll, right. I'll email you some episodes of a uh, dark side of the ring there you can watch them free you know on youtube uh I'll, I'll email some of them for you. I would love. I feel foolish for not having watched it yet. Calling myself a wrestling fan and and somehow missing this. So yeah, please do. Um, but uh, you know, you said something else in our correspondence before, uh, where you don't uh, do any like don't partake of any substances, be it alcohol or anything else, when you're writing, because you said it would feel like a cheat. Do you still hold pretty strong to that? Yeah, I do actually. I don't know. I mean, and and please, you know, I, I don't. I run the risk of coming across as as preachy here. I'm nah. just. I'm. I'm saying for for me, uh, when when I have done that in the past, when when I get, you know, kind of giddy from from drinking and I'm writing, for me that just feels like I'm uh, cutting a corner that it allows me to be funny in a way that I normally wouldn't have access to. And, uh, I know this is, I take this shit too seriously. Uh, I should just, you know, who, who cares? However you get the job done. Right. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I would know if I reread the thing, I would know, Oh, that's funny. Well, it's just cause you had a, a few, Miller lights in you. That's why it's funny. Hey, that's you know. what I'm drinking right now. There you go. Enjoy your Pilsner. <laughs> um, so, uh, I mean, have you, uh, you said you've done signings and everything. Like, I, di I didn't even know that. You know, I thought you were like an underground, you know, uh, cultivated taste. But if, I mean, did they, th were there big turnouts to these signings? Yeah, but only in Europe. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, okay, so for, for those first three books, I did do some signings in America, uh, just, you know, modest crowds in Kentucky and Indiana. But no, it's it's a, a totally different world over there. Uh, and not, you know, they've it, it's been translated in 16 different languages. So, yeah. Um, it they've done well in French and strangely they've done well in Romanian. And, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, for me, it's, it's shocking to, you know, walk down the streets of Henderson, Kentucky and basically be an unknown. And then to go to, you know, like Berlin and have people show up and, and actually, uh, listen to me. It's 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 just surreal. Um, so you're like the George R. R. Martin of Germany. Uh, we, I would, I don't produce those kinds of numbers. Certainly not. But <laughs> have you ever been able Maybe. to make a car or house payment with book money? Yeah, yeah. I had some good years in my twenties, uh, oh. but. Let, let me be clear for most of my writing career, you know, for the majority of my writing career, I've had to supplement my royalties with uh, other jobs, mainly teaching. In fact, right now I'm a full time high school teacher. Do they ever get rowdy and like challenge you? Do you know, are you prepared for that? I those are some <laughs> are of ready? the I'm ready to rest one. <laughs> are you ready to beat up teenagers? <laughs> no. You've done it before. Are, are you like the cool teacher that like they, they vibe with? I, gosh, I mean, if I say, well, yeah, of course, I sound like an <laughs> asshole. Yeah, I, I'm the, right, I'm the cool teacher. I'm like Fonzie. That that reference shows how cool I am. I'm the Fonzie right. of Henderson County High. I bet you no, are the, I, cool, the cool teacher that everybody like gets along with though well th thank you for saying that uh let, are you let an me, ap teacher or just regular uh 
I mostly teach regular. I do have one advanced class and get this. It, it's sophomore, sophomore English. Uh, so that's, that's a really tough age. I would never say, yeah, I'm uh, the cool teacher. I don't, I'm a dork. I, if they like me, it's only because I'm a big dork. And they probably feel sorry for me, but I, I will say I, I, in general, my teaching philosophy is don't get upset over stupid little shit. Like, yeah, they're going to get on their cell phones. They're going to text. Do I want to spend 45 minutes focusing on that? You know, I, so uh, it, it takes quite a bit to, to really upset me in class. And it, you teach English? Yes. Okay. What about creative it, writing? Yeah, is there any creative writing aspect yeah, actually, of it? Yeah, actually, this this year they gave me an elective, so I oh. teach uh, creative writing fifth period, and that's a lot of fun. So could Jeremy come over there and audit that class? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, nowadays it's online, so I guess he could take it at home if he wants. Yeah, I think but... he might need to. <laughs> I, I just can't believe that, that your students aren't like jumping at the chance if they're, you know, so inclined to ha to use, you know, a creative writing class as an elective that they wouldn't jump at the chance to check out your work. You know, do they even know that you produce this work? I guess is the question. Yeah. Uh, so usually what happens about halfway through the school year, like one of them will uh, Google me and there's there's quite a bit that can be found about me online and and so that i think that impresses them more than the the fact that i've written a book or the fact that i've been translated in 16 language they're just like hey man do you know if you type in joey goble on google like you can see pictures of them and that <laughs> that's that's what amazes them that's the measuring stick now so do you do you ever hear anything from like uh you know, uh, moral busybodies in the community that say things like this guy writes books that are maybe inappropriate for children. And yet he is a high school teacher, um, you know, molding the, the, the fragile minds of our youth. I've been afraid of that happening. Um, it hasn't yet because that would require people to actually read the book. <laughs> but, uh, the whole reason I actually got out of English in uh, college because I was going to do that and then be a teacher. But then I just realized that the stuff I write is just too, like, that same thing would happen. And I looked up that the, it actually did happen to this woman who wrote romance novels mm -hmm. and, like, freaking community went ballistic because of one person uh bringing it up and it just i didn't want to get involved in that it, that's stupid the, yeah. the especially yeah, if they're high school students yeah the thought right. has crossed yeah. my, and also before i wrote i was a, a musician and you know it was punk rock and um but i mean to, to anybody that would want to take me down like that I, I would say that if if you and I, I hope Jeremy would agree with this, if you actually read the book cover to cover, you'll see that these are tales of morality. They they endorse being decent, moral people. Yes, right. there there's rough language. Okay, you, you're gonna see the f bomb. There, right. there's substance abuse in it. There's sex. There, there mm -hmm. are adult situations. Oh my God! Uh, but in I don't the think end, it's inappropriate though. I really don't. Yeah, I don't either. It's, yeah. it's but and by today's standards, especially, I think it's quite tame. So yeah, I um, I don't think it would it would be a problem. It's not right. like, I mean, the kids hear worse than that on the bus, right? Exactly. I, yeah. and I, I tell the, I tell them, you know, you all would like these books. This, this is not, <laughs> uh, Julius Caesar. This is not to kill a mockingbird. Y'all should try, uh, finding a copy on Amazon. Do the, do your they students could, ever come to you after have read, after having read the book to say anything to you about it or, or no, they just don't they, bother. No, some of them actually have read it, which is, it's, quite sweet i'm taken aback when that happens and um sometimes i say like i hope this didn't make you look at me in a different way or like i hope it didn't make you think this guy 
doesn't know what he's talking about and he's been up here teaching us the whole time uh but so far they've been very sweet about it and compliment they even have me will you will you sign it oh, for me cool. mr goat so yeah they're there i got a lot of good kids these 15 and 16 year old kids in in henderson kentucky they're uh they've given me faith in in the future of uh humanity Wow, have you ever had any good to hear. kids who were like inspiring writers? A lot of the ones that take the creative writing class are pretty serious about it. And um, and so I'm, I'm careful to kind of ride the line between encouragement and discouragement. You know, I'm all for people following their dreams. Um, but I advise them to always have a, a backup plan. For instance... Uh, I got a, a, a master's degree knowing that I probably couldn't support myself full time with writing. At least you're nice about it. When I was in high school, <laughs> I was like, probably, and I, I know that I wasn't the only one, but I felt like pretty much the only aspiring writer taking like, you know, the AP classes and stuff. And in a way, the freaking teachers were, especially the English teachers, one in particular just completely ostracized me for the fact that I wanted to write which was and was into books which was really weird because it seems like they would be like all for a kid who's like in the subject into the subject material but that just didn't happen they were complete jerks about it I hate to hear that yeah it make it begs the question why did this person become a teacher in the first place it I mean, seems I, like it seems like most of the creative writing teachers I've come across, like half of their job is to crush your dreams. <laughs> uh, Granted, that oh, I was gonna say it's uh, like yeah, the advice of yeah, just be sure to keep a day job is good advice, but uh, like half of them are uh, that I've come across are basically like that. No, don't be a writer. Don't do it. Don't. <laughs> I mean, a lot of it is. Yeah, I mean, when I've heard that, generally it's the main criticism is that you're producing something that's genre fiction, right? And everybody wants to discourage folks from writing genre fiction, you know, like in the, you know, high school, college English courses, right? They all kind of look, thumb their nose at it, right? It's not serious. Oh, it wasn't, you know? it wasn't even that one. Like when I was in college, I didn't really write that much genre fiction, but when I went told like one of them that I wanted to be a writer, these looked at me like I was a fucking retard. Hey, uh, I hate to hear that. Um, yeah. I think writing is, and I don't care what type of writing it is, It's that's time well spent. Um, now, I have an eight-year-old. Would, would I say, hey, Joe, I, uh, you, you need to pursue writing novels. That's, that's a great idea. For, that's a great life decision. I, I wouldn't put it to him like that. Um, I, I would advise anybody to know what it is you're getting into. Um, but any, any type of art, music, visual arts, writing, I, I think this is something that should be, uh, encouraged. Have, have you ever, uh, heard, uh, wild man Fisher? No. Yeah. He, he, yeah. He's a, he was a, like a weird outsider music singer. He has one song called Don't Be a Singer where the lyrics are like, all you'll ever meet are cheaters and liars and liars and thieves and robbers and swindlers. Don't be a singer. Hmm. It yeah. kind of reminds me of Torture the Artist. Like, if, if, I'm, if I'm understanding you correctly, artists me. tend to uh, attract difficulties. Well, yeah, I mean, Wild Man Fisher was schizophrenic, so mm. he had a lot of difficulties in that. Yeah, for, he he did. Uh, he was in Frank Zappa's band, but uh, got fired because he he threw a beer uh, bottle and it almost hit uh, Moon Unit, his daughter. Mm. Yeah, while she was still a baby. Yeah. Wow, that's to get kicked out of Frank Zappa's band. That's that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I think it was that hard to do. I think all he had to do was, you know, mess up doing drugs or something, right? Wasn't he kind of like an anti-drug yeah, kind of no. guy? Yeah. No, uh, Zappa was actually straight edge. I don't know. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 
As but, I was saying that, I thought actually Zappa's known for he was very professional, but right. you know, you get my point. You know, <laughs> he's a wild and crazy dude. It it seems like it might be difficult. I guess a better. Com- I love the band The Replacements, and they were known for their uh well how should i put this they weren't known for their sobriety but uh their guitarist got kicked out of the band for partying too hard and and so he had to live that down the rest of his life how do you be the guy that got kicked out of the replacements right how how fucked up do you have to be to be that guy hey you know one thing that you might uh look into that might uh be you know attract some success in american you know sales maybe turn your books into audio books if you haven't already oh gosh um there's a market for that right yeah I so. well, i don't know a lot yeah. about it I mean, I mean, I don't think he's suggesting that you actually read them even though that might be something you might be interested in but yeah, you know them, yeah yeah, I don't, I don't know how it works when you have a publisher, but I mean, like the indie um, authors I know, you know, they just hire someone to read it for them. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, especially if they're fairly. I mean, it sounds like a number of them are humorous, right? I think those would probably do mm-hmm. well in the audiobook format. Well, a lot of people who are always busy, uh, maybe they travel a lot. They're truckers, you know, or uh, they just, you know, have a long commute to work. Uh, a lot of those types listen to audiobooks. It's the only way they can, you know, read basically is not read but listen. So that might yeah. be something to look into. I don't know. I hadn't thought about it a lot. I know uh, over in Germany they hired some actors to do the anomalies, and that so they would like have a different actor for each character. Hmm. But um, I don't know. I don't think that one really sold too well. Really. Well, we got we got to get the. Joey but in the U.S., the the ebook market, I mean, not ebook market, the audiobook market's uh, a very growing uh, market. Yeah, I'm here. I keep hearing about this Audible thing. So. Right. Oh. Yeah, I'd say it makes a lot of money, not in just sales, but they're so freaking expensive. Like one oh, okay. audiobook is like, boy, normal like twenty bucks. Huh. Yeah, at least, yeah, depending on the length of the book, yeah. But we got to get this Joey Goble brand activated again. I I hate that word brand, but I mean <laughs> I feel like you know you're due a resurgence of some sort or or an awakening. You know. I I hope I hope so. I it's He's weird for it. But yeah, it's weird <laughs> like to think about how long ago these books. I, I feel so old, you know, but the anomalies, it was actually published in, uh, Oh three, I believe. So here we are. It's 17. That's that boggles my mind. You don't, you don't you're kill probably, time. Well, yeah, you've probably gone through phases where you felt mediocre or, or, you know, I, I would imagine because you haven't been able to realize success on like a huge level, but your books have been out there, they've touched people, and they're part of the uh, zeitgeist. And you can never uh, underrate uh, that, you know? Thank you. Thank you. That's, um, yeah, um, I, I got kind of, I don't even know if it would qualify as a cult following in America, I do know that when the anomalies and torture the artists came out, uh, there's a pretty loyal little following because it got promoted. The books were promoted on the Chuck Palahniuk website, oh. and he was just white hot back then. Um, so I always really right. appreciated that. Well, you know, they he got run out of uh, some community writing community in Portland in his home town you know uh for not be you know uh, kneeling at the altar of political correct hyper political mm. correctness you know so, yeah yeah that's another problem in publishing uh if you ask me he also got all of his money stolen yeah really yeah yeah, yeah one his, of his uh, publisher yeah 
Oh, yeah, man. like one of one Go of ahead. his. I was yeah, I was just gonna say one of his agents or something defrauded him a bunch of money. What a drag! Did you ever get to talk to? Yeah, him? I was a, yeah, I was a literary agent, right? Yeah, and he oh. defrauded all kinds of authors during that. You know, that belonged to that agency. But yeah, he he basically got tons of money, you know, stolen from him and never get back. Yeah. If Whoa. I remember correctly, I think his agent was actually an actor. Um, he was on Frasier. And now I don't, I don't know if we're talking about the same person here, but. Uh, no, I never had any communication with, uh, Paul and Nick himself. It was the guy that ran his website. He, uh, interviewed me and was very nice. Um, what would a Joey Goble sci-fi novel, you said you flirted with genre fiction, the idea of it, what would a Joey Goble science or fiction novel look like maybe? What what some what are some like ideas that you've had rattling around? <laughs> um, I actually tried one uh, several years ago, and um, it just it 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 was not good. It was not good. It, but um, I don't know. It it toyed around with the idea of someone with christ-like powers reappearing on earth um being able to to do all the things that uh christ did in the bible and um but i think it, it turned out he was an alien or something it's i don't know kind of a oh man that's funny you mentioned that because we had a guest on like two shows ago that that was saying that that's what was really gonna happen that like the <laughs> That that like the cosmic Christ was gonna come down in the a, like yeah, but as like it was gonna be like straight out of the Borg's like cube spaceship or whatever, and they were gonna land in Israel. It was just crazy. It's just yeah, and he said the, the, the Antichrist is gonna have the Star Trek insignia, <laughs> <laughs> and he was serious. That's he's a he's a pastor, I think. So that's really scary. But no, that's funny you mentioned that. Um, so you didn't get very far with that? I finished it actually, but I've uh shelved it. It's I don't I do not feel good about that book. Do you redraft? Uh do I redraft? It, when you write. I've never yeah. been able to I've never yeah. been able to do that. Start completely over after you finish one. I just Wait, people actually do that as in write a book and then write it again. Well, that's first draft, second draft, right? I mean, no, I, yeah. thought I they mean, would just take it and like edit it and like right. come up with different yeah. edits. They probably did it more when they just had typewriters, but right. Um, I prefer to rewrite as I go along. Mm -hmm. So no, right. I, I, I don't. You know, say oh, okay, this is a first draft done, and then go back. I'm doing it the entire time I'm writing. Right? Yeah, you're always editing as you go. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, I don't know that. I mean, are there people that actually they write a single draft and then they put it in a drawer, never look at it, and then write the whole story again from scratch? I mean, how many times people do that? I don't that's know. what you're talking I, about, Jeremy. Right? I've just heard people say talk about first draft second draft final draft and it's like I, I just don't i couldn't do it you know i finished i've only finished short stories i've never written a full length i hit a brick wall usually at like somewhere around thirty thousand words so right I, I but i couldn't imagine doing that you know that way so I, I mean i think that back in the day with typewriters right when they talked about first second third draft i mean i think that's genuinely they're talking about actually retyping the thing mm -hmm. right uh, i think so yeah but with the with computer with uh, word processing i mean i think that when people say draft they really probably mean a, you know uh um uh focused pass like an editing pass you know what i mean more than a true retyping of the manuscript you know yeah yeah i mean sometimes i'll actually print out uh, an entire draft 
and uh, my eye tends to catch things on paper that it, it wasn't on the screen for whatever right. reason. But yeah, I did that too. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, I think word processing has kind of blurred what drafts even are what what right. used to be called first draft second draft now it just kind of all runs together right it's more like a pass you know like mm-hmm. i mean if i you know I've, I've got a kind of a system or whatever as far as editing goes right so you know like there's a particular pass which i call like a draft right where i'll print out the manuscript mark it up and then you know do the edits or whatever and then i'll say that's a draft i'm done with that right and then you know there's very various different things that are like my job on each individual draft right uh you know like you know i'll look for continuity errors in one draft or i'll look for you know light copy edit you know the various different uh missions when i'm going through the book on various passes and i'll call those drafts essentially but it's not a true draft and then i'm not retyping the manuscript i must be lazy because i just do like i'll write the book then i'll do the thing sometimes i'll print it out and sometimes i won't but i just go through it once but i mean like joey i think well i mean i think that means oh. you're smarter than me or i'm sloppy you know so <laughs> i mean i you know I, I go through the thing like 15 times you know easily you know? sounds like it's not really a sloppy thing you're just like a your personality is like very punctual. <laughs> kind of like an OCD type thing. Maybe, maybe, or maybe I just, you know, it could be just a matter of I'm not, uh, I just don't do it right <laughs> first time around. I'm, I gotta, I'm sloppy and I gotta just uh, go back and fix uh, tons of crap, whereas I should maybe be editing as I go. So, I mean, um, go seems with, the same as with me. I have to go through like a hundred fucking times to get all yeah. the typos and they still slip through. Yeah, likewise, yeah. You know, I never really have typos in my finished books. Like, I remember when Swamp Beast, like, literally, like, the editor for that book only had, like, I could probably, it it may have actually been less than 10 actual markings in the entire manuscript. Well, you're a child prodigy, though. We're not all child prodigies. I mean, you're the ones publishing books in high school. I don't know about prodigy. If I was a prodigy, I would have made more money. We can't all be big fucking galaxy brains like you. Yeah, I mean, exactly. You and you and St- Kevin Strange need to get together on a podcast and brag about just easily writing award-winning fiction. You know, I've never won an award. Oh, okay. Well, he can teach you how to do it. It's easy. Um. Well. Normally, if this were still the weekend, you know, I'd, I'd we'd be able to, I'd be able to keep this up for hours. But I do have to get up at four a.m., so you know, I only have a few hours left. Um, does anybody else have any more questions for Joey before we wrap up? Yeah. So, what are you working on now? I've started a new book since this uh, quarantine thing started, and uh, it's. The concept, it's its just a pure, pure comedy. This one's not so literary. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not worried about symbolism. I'm not worried about theme. I, I just want people to laugh. That's the, the whole point of it. And so that's kind of a departure for me to, to just, ha- it's meant to entertain. Um, and the concept is basically the, the guy writing it is, I'm writing it in character and this, this particular guy doesn't really know how to write. So Mm -hmm. there's some, there's some comedy there, uh, watching someone, uh, attempt something that they, they don't have the aptitude for. Uh, Mm -hmm. My detractors would probably argue, well, that's been the basis of your entire career, right? (laughs) (laughs) So, so is that uh, do you outline or you just uh, you know go for it? Uh, normally I outline, but I'm trying something different this time. Mm. I, I'm trying to uh, rediscover the joy in mm. writing. And what's happened to me over the last 20 years, it, it has become work and I will spend you know six months uh, outlining the thing. And uh, this time I'm just, 
making a conscious effort to just have fun with it. And right. so outlines aren't a lot of fun. And so this time I'm just kind of sitting down and, and writing when I feel like it and uh, trying to just be healthier about the whole thing and not allow it to overtake my life. So is this book under contract? Um, you not exactly. Uh, the uh, what I have going on is my German publisher has the right of first refusal. So whatever right. I write next, they they will uh, see it first. Right. But but no, it's I wouldn't say it's technically under contract. Right. All right. I got gotcha. you. Right of first refusal. Yeah, that's pretty common. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, the idea is whatever comes next, they they have the right to look at it first. And then if they say no thanks, then I can take it wherever I want. But yeah, they got um, first dibs. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Well, Joey, uh, it was an honor to meet you. And uh, I appreciate you uh, giving me your time. And, of course. Uh, and I wish uh, – I wish – uh, there was there was more out there, you know, to to read uh, by you. You know, this is a real big uh, hurdle, you know, to overcome as an American reader. <laughs> well, uh, Jeremy, thank you so much for having me on here, and uh, I hope all you fellas remain healthy. And um, I uh, promise you, I will be working on getting these books uh, published in English. Awesome. All right. That sounds great. Well, thanks, y'all. Yeah, nice uh, to meet you. Nice to meet you. Night. Yeah. You thanks. as well. Bye-bye. Thanks for I'll definitely pick up your books. Talk Thank to you later. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. There, you happy I didn't spoil anything? You did good, Jeremy. You yeah, did you did really good. You act like a normal person <laughs> for almost the whole time. Yeah. Yeah, I had Yeah, pets. but I didn't get to talk about the thing.